let's uh, pick up where we left off last time. We're trying to, to bridge from what we learned with gravity to what we're doing with electricity because there are a lot of similarities. We started out by talking about the fact that these are forces that act at a distance, right? These two objects don't have to touch each other to exert forces on each other. And how do we visualize that? How do we come to grips with that? Well, one model for coming to grips with that is the field model. That an object with mass fills the space around it with a gravitational field. And any other object with mass that's in that gravitational field interacts with the field and feels a force because of that interaction. And we can do the same thing now with our electrical charges. Say any object with electrical charge fills the space around it with an electric field. Other charged objects that are in that field interact with the field and feel a force because of that interaction. How do we draw the field lines? The direction a positive charge would go if we let go of a positive charge at that location. So the field lines point the direction a positive charge would go if we stuck one there. That's why the, they point outward from a positive charge and they point inward to a negative charge. Another way of thinking of it, the electric field lines originate or begin on positive charges, they terminate or end on negative charges. That's another way of thinking of it. And then we said we really want to introduce this concept of an electric field. Well, we did a similar thing with gravity. We didn't really call it the gravitational field, but we know the gravitational force, g m1 m2 over r squared, and we know we have a very similar expression for an electric force, right? K q1 q2 over r squared. Well, we got tired when we were doing our uh, weights of objects on the surface of the earth, we got tired of doing this calculation all the time. So we said on the surface of the earth, we can just plug in the mass of the earth, we can plug in g, and we can plug in the radius of the earth, and what does that equal? That equals g, 9.8. And then we can just multiply whatever mass we're interested in on the surface of the earth by g, and we get the force of gravity acting on that object. Okay, we, this is something we're very familiar with, right? So we're going to do the same thing with electric fields because we're going to get tired of, let's say a certain charge creates an electric field. So here we've got two objects. Oops. Call that capital Q. And we've got some little charge over here, little q. And the force between them is k q q over r squared, right? But maybe we're going to put a different charge over here next time. Maybe we're going to put q prime over there, or q3, or q4. Maybe we're going to keep changing this. And we don't want to do this calculation every time. But this charge is pretty much fixed. So we could say, well, what's the electric field at this location? That's our location of interest, right? That's where we keep putting these charges. Due to this, this charge distribution that's fixed, that's not going to change. So we want to find an electric field over here. And then how do we do that? We divide out the effect of the Q that we're placing there, the little Q. So our electric field is just equal to the force divided by little q. That's the electric field due to everything else in the system except for little q, right? And then if we want to know what the force is, we multiply it by q. This is a vector equation. And so if q is positive, F and E point in the same direction. That's what I just told you earlier, right? The electric field points the direction a positive charge would go if we stuck it there. So if Q is positive, they point in the same direction. If Q is negative, it flips the vector by 180 degrees. That's what a negative sign does, right, to a vector quantity. The magnitude's the same, the direction is switched 180 degrees. All right, so we talked about this a little bit yesterday, and we'll continue thinking about it in these terms but we want to get used to thinking about the electric field because oftentimes 
we're not dealing with just two point charges, so we want to uh, get in the fact that it's a more complicated charge distribution. So once we know the electric field, we've got the electric field at that location, then any charge we put at that location, we can figure out the force acting on that charge. Okay, so it's, it's not too different from what we've done with gravity. And, uh, and let's just throw a term in here, because we are, I already showed you here that the electric field is F over Q. And what is F? F is K, Q1, Q2 over R squared. And I'm just going to call that Q2. So we divide that by Q2, and we get K, Q1 over R squared. So this is the electric field from a point charge. because that's the electric force between two point charges. And I divided out one of them, and that gives me the electric field. So this is the electric field from Q1, a distance r away from Q1, okay, due to Q1. So I think what I'd like to do, the, one of the handouts we had yesterday, <clears throat> the back side of it we had not gotten to yet. Has these uh, three students discussing this problem. Let's talk about that. Okay, two different cases. In both cases, the charges on the outside are the same. In case A, we put a positive 6 charge in the middle. In case B, we put a positive 3 charge in the middle. They're comparing the electric field that's exerting a force on the middle charge. Okay? Student A says, all three charges contribute by the principle of superposition. So the field is going to be the greatest in case A, since the contributions due to the three charges will be the greatest. Should we read all three of them first? or? Uh you're formulating ideas. Student B, I think it's a bogus question. The field at that point is undefined because there's a charge there. Student C, you're wrong. The field that exerts a force on the middle charge is the field due to all the other charges in the region. Since these don't change, the field acting on the middle charge is the same in both cases. We're trying to find the force on that middle charge, and we're changing it in one case to the other. So I told you already, we can just find the field at that location, and then plug in the charge we're putting there to find the force. So what, what do you think about student A's response? All three charges contribute by the principle of superposition. You're shaking your head. Why not? The dependence of that charge that we're looking for the force on, right? We're going to bring it in later. So what do I have here? Let's pretend there was only, let's pretend that this guy wasn't here. So I've got two charges there, right? Two charges. So so here's an equation that deals with the force between two charges. 
what do I do to find the electric field? I divide out one of the charges, right? And then I multiply it back in later when I want to find the force on it. I say the force is equal to Q2 times E. Right? So when I'm finding the electric field at that location, I don't count Q2. I count all the other charges in the problem. And then when I want to know what the force is on Q2, I multiply in Q2 at the end times the electric field due to all the other forces. There are charges around, just Q2 sitting there all by itself. Would there be a force on Q2? No, right? it can't push on itself. It has to be another charge for it to interact with. So if we included, somehow included Q2 in the electric field calculation, and then later we went and said, now we're going to multiply by Q2 to get the force, then it's as if Q2 is pushing on itself, right? We're including an effect due to Q2 exerting a force on itself, which can't be. So what we want to do here is ignore the charge of interest and say, let's find the electric field here due to all the other charges in this, in this problem. Once we know the electric field at that location, we multiply it by that charge, and it tells us the force acting on that charge. OK? And how do we get the electric field at this location due to these other two charges? The fancy word we use? Superposition, right? They were right about that. We use the superposition. What does that mean? It means we look at each one individually and add them up. So we look at the electric field due to this charge at this location. We do to the electric, the electric field from this charge at this location. And we use vector addition to add them together. What are we going to get for the electric field at that location? Zero, right? Let, let me. Uh, This is a negative charge, so the electric field points toward it, right? I'll call this charge uh, 1. That's going to be E1. And then the electric field from charge 2 is going to point this way. It's going to point towards charge 2. And when we add those two vectors, those are equal and opposite because Q, uh, Q1 and Q2 are equal. They're both negative 3. So those are equal and opposite vectors. So we add them together, we get 0. So there's not going to be any force on this acting on this charge that we stick at that location. But as far as student A is concerned, they say all three charges contribute by superposition. That's not true, right? Every charge contributes by the principle of superposition, except the one that we want to calculate the force on, because it can't push on itself. OK, and uh, student B, the field is undefined at that location because there's a charge there. So again, how do we come to grips with this? <laughs> we don't include the charge that's there. We're finding the electric field at that location due to everything else. And then we use F equals QE to figure out the force on that charge. OK? And student C, you're wrong. Oh, they got that right, right? <laughs> the field that exerts a force on the middle charge is the field due to all the other charges in the region. That's correct. Since those don't change, the field acting on the charge is the same in both cases. So student C got it right. And it happens to be zero in both cases.